What's up, everybody? Candace Cooper here, Locked on ACC. We have a special guest, Danny Cannell, here to talk to us about the best odds and lines here as we get ready for a really exciting week five for ACC football. We're going to make sure that you guys are locked and covered. Get your money right, right? That's all it is about here is making sure that you get it together when it comes to bet online. You are Locked on ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, everybody? Danny Cannell is in the building. Talk to us about the best odds and lines here with Bet Online. We are talking about, more importantly, week five of ACC football, which is probably going to be arguably the most exciting time. I see Danny is repping the Seminoles. I don't know if you know Danny, but the Seminoles are very hard here on this podcast. They are very critical of me. Jordan Travis is supposed to win the Heisman. Every time I talk bad about him, I get a lot of mentions. So just prepping yourself for what should be a good show. That's okay, Candice. Um, I have been on the other side of FSU Twitter, too. It is not a very fun place to be. When the Rose Bowl, last time Florida State made the playoffs, which feels like forever ago, they were playing Oregon. And I, as an analyst, I thought Oregon was the better team. I thought Florida State was a little bit up and down, so I picked the Ducks to win. And you would have thought, like, I just burned my diploma like out in the middle of Dope Campbell Stadium. And it doesn't mean I wasn't rooting for them. Like, clearly, I was rooting for them, but I'm trying to do my job as a professional. So right. I apologize on behalf of FSU Twitter, although <laughs> I can't guarantee you that they're going to take it easy on you because they don't take it easy on anybody, even former Florida State Seminoles. So yes. we'll have some that, fun, though. Yeah, that feels good to know that it's not just me because they've just been ragging me, but it's fine. They have a great game going into this weekend with Wake Forest. Currently, the line is minus seven for Florida State, and a lot of people are saying Florida State is really back. Their brand, they're building it, they're trying to get you right. Mike Norvell is doing the damn thing, and a lot of people at the beginning of the season weren't so high on him, but now it feels like because we're winning, all of that last season stuff doesn't matter. What are your thoughts around this matchup and just what the program has been so far this season? So I get, I'm really like cautiously optimistic, but my optimism keeps growing each week that I see Florida State play. And I hate the term they're back, right? I don't want to be the butt of every joke the way Texas is, the way Miami is, the way some other programs that were historically powerhouses and then have struggled to get quote back. I love the way Mike Norvell, is, uh, Mike Norvell has approached it by saying, we're not back. We're going to get back to work every single week. Like That's his message, and I love the way he approaches the season. But I think it's been – so the last two years, and this is what I've been telling Florida State fans because I get us all the time. You know, What do you think of Coach Norvell? What do you think of the program? And I'm like, first year was COVID. That's a that's a, a wash. Like that, And for yeah. a lot of programs, especially for first-year coaches, that's a <laughs> yeah. wash. Yeah. Then last year – Bumpy start, right? You lose Notre Dame, you lose in Jacksonville State. I'm like, let's just see how it plays out. Just take a deep breath. Don't yeah. freak out. <laughs> and I thought he really laid the foundation, clearing out some guys maybe that hadn't bought in, maybe that didn't sign up to play for Mike Norvell, signed up to play for somebody else. But the thing that really stuck out with me last year was the fight that the guys showed on the field. Like they yeah. kept fighting, they were playing hard got their way back, were this close to bowl eligibility, then lose the game against Florida at the Swamp, which was rough. But like I was like, you know what? A lot of teams would have thrown in the towel on their coach, but I didn't see yeah. that. I saw a team who responded. And then if you really dove into the tape and started watching the film, Jordan Travis starting to play a little bit. Like he started yeah. to improve. And then I was up there this spring, and I actually got to be like an honorary coach for the spring practice. So I got to watch practice, got to see you know guys in the face, like look at the, the roster – yeah. And after talking to some coaches, I was like, this this program's got a chance here. I thought to go over their win total, which was seven and a half, and I still feel really great about that. But still, that's only eight and four, which by Florida State standards is kind of like, eh, you know, like, all right, yeah. when, when are we going to get 10 wins? But I really <laughs> felt like a lot of this season hinged on the LSU game mm. and avoiding that disaster, because it would have been disastrous if they would have blown the lead and lost. Avoiding yeah. that, coming back, putting a stamp on it against Duquesne or just Duquesne was before that putting a stamp on it against Louisville, which was a really yeah. tricky game 
A lot of injuries. Jordan Travis gets hurt. That was like a resilient, tough, mentally tough win. And then just the the win against BC, which was a blowout. It's like, all right, this team is doing the things that they used to do, which was handle Mm -hmm. their business when they're supposed to. You know, it doesn't matter who you're playing. You find a way to win. So I've been really impressed with what Florida State has done. So it's been awesome to watch. And I, yeah. like, every week I'm like, just keep keep getting a little bit better. Just keep getting a little better. And yeah. sure enough, they've been doing that. Yeah. How how do you think Jordan Travis being able to be QB1 and there being no questions about that, right? He doesn't have to battle. doesn't have to have two quarterbacks at kickoff. How important has it been for him to be the leader from the get-go and still be the leader despite injury? Candace, I think that's been huge. Um you know, as somebody who's been in quarterback battles and, you know, tried to win over not only the coach and your teammates, but your fan base, it can be really tough and it can yeah. be very taxing and mentally it wears on you and it can impact your confidence. I don't know if that was the case with Jordan Travis, but I don't feel like he really felt like he was the guy because he wasn't. He did have to, you know, compete for playing time. And when Kenzie Milton came in, he's a very accomplished quarterback who has a great and they got along great. But it's still like, whose team is it? And we didn't figure that out till the second half of the season. Then for an entire offseason, an entire spring, it's Jordan Travis's team. Mm -hmm. And I thought that really you could tell. And I thought you could tell both from what he was doing on the field and they built a system around Jordan Travis where they're really flourishing. Because And that's, that's a credit to the offensive coordinator and to Mike Norvell by putting this game plan together that really suits his style. Mm -hmm. But also... You see him in between series on the sideline. You know, you see the players start to respond to him because there's no doubt. They're like, that's our guy. And that's a big difference for a team to know their guys. And there's that saying that's always been, you know, tried and true. If you have two quarterbacks, you have none. And that's kind of what Florida State has been in that, that situation for the past few years. Now they got their guy and there's no turning back and he's flourished in that role. Absolutely. And then going up against a really good quarterback like Sam Hartman in that defense, how important will it be for Florida State to play their game and how much of an advantage will it, will it be for them to be playing at home? So that was interesting because I was a little bit, um, my eyebrows were raised, as was every Florida State fan. And Dave Clawson was, you know, talking about the hurricane and the impact it could have. And he was wondering if people were going to come back. And he did throw in a reference to Vanderbilt, said maybe it's going to be quiet. And I do think FSU Twitter and FSU students and FSU fans were like, oh, really? You don't think we're going to show up? You know, with Floridians, we're used to hurricanes and thoughts and prayers. Like, you don't want to make light of a very, very serious hurricane, which people have been devastated. Obviously, you want to, you know, show a lot of concern for them. But for Floridians, you kind of do like you battle through it and you come back and you get back with your life if you can, if you're out, out of one of these places. So Florida State fans will come back and they'll be like, all right, let's go. Like, we got a game. Let's go. We'll go back to cleanup after the game. I think they're going to be absolutely berserk this weekend. I mean, this is a program, first time in the top 25 in five years, as you know. They've been desperate to kind of get out there and root for a winner. And now that you've got one, we saw it against BC. Massive crowd. I think you'll see the same um, for the people that can make it back. And I think that'll be a pretty packed house. But I think, like, aside from the crowd – You mentioned Sam Hartman. He is absolutely balling. And what he did against Clemson, like keeping his team in that game single-handedly with six touchdown passes, it was pretty remarkable. And their system is very tricky. because I And I was wrong about the way – I thought Clemson's defensive line would really mess up the mesh point of that zone read where they – it's like, what are they doing? Are they going to hand it off? Are they going to – what are they doing? Like, where's the ball? (laughs) And when they do that, like – The defensive line is crashing, and they think they've got a sack. Linebackers are coming up like he's going to hand it off. And then at the very, very, very last second, he pulls it out, and he puts these perfect touch passes to maybe the best wide receiving core in the ACC. (laughs) It is extremely, extremely tough to defend. So, And with Jared Verse and, you know, some injury issues along the defensive front, it's going to be challenging. But I do think Florida State's secondary – will be better than Clemson's, which is pretty crazy because Clemson's one of the better defenses in the country. But they got picked on uh, last week. But I think this could be a high-scoring game because I do think Jordan Travis and Florida State's wide, re- wide receiving core, which is showing a lot of depth and other different guys are stepping up every week, I think it could be a little bit more of a high-scoring affair. 
Yeah, for Florida State, it's always helpful to have a six seven receiver or yeah. tight end or whatever you want to call him, right? Like it's all it's always good to have that at your helm. But you know, switching tra- transitioning over to Clemson, like you mentioned, their defense is supposed to be the top of the town. Everyone talks about them, and it seems as if they have the most points allowed in comparison to NC State. NC State's defense is really flying under the radar. A lot of people aren't really talking about them as much, but not really as a team, and they're still winning and pulling off great wins. This is arguably one of the best matchups we're going to have here in Week 5, two top 10 teams. Have you noticed anything about NC State that you're saying it could be a really good matchup as they head into Death Valley? Oh, it's going to be a good matchup. I mean, Dave Dorn is one of the most – I'd say underrated coaches in the country. I don't think he gets enough credit for building a consistent winner in Raleigh and for, you know, churning out guys to the NFL almost every season for having a defensive front, which is always very physical. And this year having a quarterback that's coming off a great year last year, a little bit inconsistent. I'm a little bit surprised Devin Leary against the better competition. East Carolina, he struggled somewhat. Against Texas Tech, he struggled somewhat. It wasn't awful, but it just wasn't yeah. up to the standard that he set last year. They'll be ready. And from the mental aspect, again, I'm a, I'm a big believer in like the vibes and the mental mindset. Where are yeah. you? And especially with college, college teams, like you know, you see it every week. Like teams, you think like they're awesome, and everybody tells them how awesome they are. Then they let down the next week, or a team that you think is down and out, they fight and they claw their way back. But I also think seeing what they saw last year happen in real time, beating Clemson yeah. was such a big deal for them. I think they come in and they're like, I don't care if game day is going to be there. I don't I don't care if it's a packed house. I don't care if DJ Uyungle is there. I don't care if they have all these. Fr- We're going to beat them. We beat them last year. We can do it again. Yeah. There is an, there is an ad- advantage, mental advantage there that some teams in the ACC don't that haven't ever beaten Clemson. So they've got yeah. that going for them. Then on the flip side, guess who's been told they lost to NC State all season, all offseason? Was Dabo, was Clemson, was every defensive player on there? So I think this game is going to be absolutely phenomenal. And again, another one where you look at a quarterback who has been probably overly criticized. But Mm. to be honest, though, from last year, it was deserved criticism. Like a lot of quarterbacks would have been benched way like at some point last year when he throws for 10 touchdowns and 11 interceptions and you're on a program like Clemson and they didn't have really an option. So they kind of like just rolled it. We're like, we're going to go with DJ. We're going to do it. And then this off season, I give Dabo so much credit for standing by his guy. Like Mm -hmm. you're way too young, but there was that stand by your man. That was like an old school (laughs) song. (laughs) So that's what Dabo has done. (laughs) <laughs> he has stood by DJ Uyongle from from last end of last season through the spring spring practice through ACC media days when he's pounding the table saying he's different he's going to go out there and he's going to ball and he really didn't early the season he had flashes and he was good but it was a little bit bumpy it just didn't look crisp yeah. and then the game he had against Wake I think was his coming out party now, mm-hmm. some people would say, well, wasn't it Notre Dame, you know, two years ago when he filled in for Trevor Lawrence? Or wasn't it one of those games? It's different when you're a backup. It really yeah. is. When you yeah. there's no pressure, like, yeah, everybody loves the backup. They want to cheer for you. If you lose, or you like, all right, we're gonna go back to Trevor Lawrence. No big deal. Yeah. The spotlight is on you as a starter, and that's different. And I think DJ was struggling with that somewhat. And then all of a sudden, people want you benched. And what about Cade Klubnik? And it's it yeah. is hard to withstand that criticism. I think that could be a seminal moment in his career where he looks at himself differently. He feels better about himself. The coaches, all the coaches, not just Dabo, they start to say, that's the guy we want to play around. His teammates look at him different. Whoa. Did you see that play made with the guy hanging on him, need a two point conversion. He still made that throw. They start to believe in him. And I think that was that type of game. I like Clemson in this game, laying the points because of some of the mental edge that goes their way, but I think it's going to be a phenomenal game. And I I do yeah. tend to think it'll be higher scoring. What's the total? I think it's 42, 43. I think there was a yeah. lot of people that hammered it down because of the hurricane, thought it was going to be weather issues. Right. I think it's going to be cleared out. I think it'll be pretty clean. And I think both of these teams, two really good quarterbacks, I think will have some success. So that's probably my favorite play in this game is the over uh, the total. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then when it boils down to it, how big of this game do you think is going to affect who's going to be the leader of the Atlantic and then ultimately probably the ACC champion? Because we talk about Coastal, but we don't even have to waste our time. It's a little chaotic over there. <laughs> we can't even yeah. figure out wins over there, you know, but this game to me seems very pivotal and who is going to be a part of that leaderboard when it's all said and done. Like these three weeks you've got, because you just had Clemson play Wake. Yep. Now you got Clemson, NC State. You've got Florida State Wake. You've got, I think, NC State Wake. Like, there's just a, the next few weeks, like, they all kind of play each other. So it's going to yeah. sort itself out. But I think you have to feel at this point like Clemson has the edge and they're kind of, mm. you know, coming back, if you will. They didn't go anywhere by any means. I mean, anybody that yeah. thought anything was over or Clemson was done with Dabo Sweeney and company was just foolish. But it does feel like they're kind of, you know, like, hey, we ain't done yet. It feels like that. But I think the best part about the ACC, which to me is having a fantastic season, is we're seeing, like, I don't think Clemson is playing down. I think other teams are raising to their level, which is what you yeah. want. That's right. what happens in other conferences. So Wake Forest, for example, goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with them in this heavyweight bout, comes up just short. But they're like, they're right on the same level. You know, NC State, I think this game, the fact that it's a single-digit you know, uh, spread, they're yeah. going to hang with them. Florida State may be a single-digit spread, which is nuts if you have told me that, you know, at the beginning of the season. Yeah. So, like, the days of people just being able to make fun of Clemson's schedule, oh, it's an ACC catwalk, and Dabo would get upset, they were, like, two touchdown favorites in all those games. There was a pretty good gap. Now yeah. that gap is closing because other teams are starting to raise their level, and that's – the best scenario for the ACC is that other teams start challenging them and play them really tough. And then the last man standing, whether it's Clemson, whether it's NC state, I don't even want to say Florida state, but maybe <laughs> in a long, but like then that team gets looked at the same way as Clemson was like playoff caliber. Yeah. Our resume is good. We played top 25 teams and you don't get looked down upon. So I think it's been a really solid start for the ACC for sure. Now we need Miami. We need Miami to get back and play a little bit better, but that's not going to happen. You know, North Carolina's <laughs> offense looks spectacular, but their defense yeah. needs to catch up now. There's some really good things happening in the conference. For Syracuse, is an unbelievable story. Like, they need to keep rolling. It's, yeah. a, it's a really good time for the conference right now, I think. Absolutely. I think the most surprising team, and I'll, I've said it blue in the face, that Mike Elko and Duke surprising and what they've been able to do and turn that program on. I said that all they needed was a good leader. Like I love coach Cutcliffe personally. I think he's a great man. I think he was past his time a little bit and he need they need that fun energy. You need guys to be really excited about what you're doing. And that it, they're not like they had scrubs. They've got guys to the league. So now you have a coach who's even more invested in that college time. So I would, wouldn't be surprised if they also are battling for that stop that a uh, top of the coastal when it's all said and done. For sure. And they just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kansas, which we never would have saw coming. But Kansas is a good team. Kansas yeah. is, is a should be a top 25 team. And I wouldn't be surprised if they win this weekend, go 5-0, and actually get to the top 25. And I love Coach Cut. He's one of my favorite coaches I've ever covered. But I'm yeah. with you. Sometimes you just need to change the scenery. Like, it's just, yep. like I've, I've talked to a bunch of coaches who feel like 10 years are kind of maxed out. Like mm -hmm. And even with college kids where you're cycling over, yeah, you need something fresh. The players need something fresh. And I think Mike Elko definitely brought that in. I interviewed him on my radio show over the summer, and I hadn't really yeah. known him that well. I was like, oh, he's pretty sharp. Like, he's a guy <laughs> smart, yeah. which yeah. works perfectly for the type of athlete you have to recruit to Duke. But yeah. also defensive background, I think that kind of turn, like you look at things differently, was something that Duke could use after having an offensive guy like Cut in there yeah. for so long. They've been a great story. If they had beat Kansas, which they were close, they might be that story that everyone's talking about and people still should. And I'm yeah. with you. They are a tough out as anybody right now in the ACC, especially in Absolutely. the COVID. Yeah, the last t game I want to talk to you about, because it could be a potential trap game, Georgia Tech losing Jeff Collins and they're facing off Pitt, who is arguably one of the best teams, if not the best team in the Coastal. If you say Jeff Collins was the issue, can you see Jeff Sims potentially being that guy who comes in and says, all right, I'm taking over. I'm doing what I got to do. The interim head coach is going to make sure I fly and do all the things and Pitt could potentially be upset. So I wish I really like his skill set and <laughs> Jeff said like I do. But I've noticed something here because, yeah. and this is wild, because I, I just can't wrap my mind around it. Last year, we saw USC fired Clay Helton in September. 
yeah. after two games. This year, we see Nebraska fire Scott Frost. We see Arizona State fire Herm Edwards. We see Georgia Tech make move with Jer- uh, Jeff Collins. And I'm, we're not even in October yet. And <laughs> I, you know, there have, and what, what, what drives me nuts is like the people that lose the most. Obviously, you're losing jobs. Like it's no fun. They're going to be yeah. fine though. They're getting payouts. Yeah. Yeah. The players, like the players, like, is this fair to the players that regardless of what you think of Jeff Collins, these players were recruited by him. They did want to play for him. Yeah. And like, there's a mindset, I think, which comes in a player's mindset, which if you fire our coach, you kind of threw in the towel on the season. Mm, okay. And like, as much as like, I, I, and I've really been looking at this because last year you saw TCU fire Gary Patterson. The next week they beat Baylor, which was a top 10 team. It was like, whoa, they got their best effort. So I came in this season, I was like, oh, Nebraska fired Scott Frost. Maybe we're going to get their best effort. They're going to come out, and they're going to possibly contend with Oklahoma. They get dusted. They get absolutely (laughs) smoked. Arizona State happened. I think it was Utah. That was just Utah. Oh, you're going to get Arizona State's best effort. No, players like hung it up. And it's not really an indictment on the coaches that remain. It's an indictment on the system, which is Mm -hmm. throwing in the towel. And I think players, they see that, and they're like, well, Who's the next coach? Like, who am I yeah. playing for? So yeah. I would actually be surprised if Georgia Tech does much here. Pitt has way more at stake. I hope I'm wrong. I would love to see, you know. A good game. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see it. And I think Jeff Sims is a, a tremendous, really talented quarterback who doesn't have a lot around him. That's probably more what it's about. But yeah. I think the tendency we've seen here recently is, is the players kind of see the writing on the wall and they're like, all right, if you're going to throw in the towel on us, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna be out here putting our bodies on the line every week, you know. We'll just go through the motions and get through this. I think that's more the trend of what we've seen. We've argued that we should bring they should bring back a triple option. What are you thinking? Like they should just go ahead and be the staple the staple school, kind of like Army. You know what you're gonna get, and like that's just who Georgia Tech is, and maybe it'll work. So Jeff Monken is that name that's been tossed around a lot, and he's had a ton of success at Army, and it's weird, right? Because the Paul Johnson era was successful. But Georgia Tech fans were kind of like, hey, everybody else is throwing the football. It'd be more fun. You know, <laughs> like, and I get it. I get it. And how do you recruit? And they would it would be used negatively against them to recruit. There are two coaches, actually, that I think that would be great. Jamie Chadwell at Coastal Carolina and Jeff Munkin at Army. But here's the thing. Jeff Munkin is a great coach. He's a great schemer. You can run the triple option and a lot and its concepts. But it doesn't have to look like the triple option that Paul Johnson ran or that Jeff Munkin runs at Army. You can pull the quarterback back in the shotgun like Jamie Chadwell does at Coastal Carolina. You can throw the ball 25, 30 times a game like Jamie Chadwell does at Coastal Carolina and run a spread option with a lot of the same concepts, blocking schemes, reads for the quarterback. But you can yeah. still be current and you know be twenty twenty two as opposed to you know, like Army, Air Force, and Navy. They're like stuck in nineteen forty one. Like it's it's yeah. wild, and it, they only throw the ball four times, but they kind of have to. They don't have the athletes. They don't have the five star quarterbacks coming in there that can throw it. They've got a system that works because there's a talent gap. You don't have the talent that you have against their schedule. Georgia Tech has challenges, but not anymore. Then other like Stanford has one, Northwestern has one, and Georgia Tech has one. Like they I don't even yeah. need to look at anybody else. They have won before and they yeah. can recruit enough to win and be competitive in the ACC. And but I think the hardest thing is how do you sell? That's why I think Jamie Chad- Chadwell is an easier sell to the fans because mm-hmm. he had a lot of success. He's young, he's exciting, and he runs an offense that crushes it. Jeff Munkin probably is the better hire, in my opinion, by a little bit because he's had more experience. Army's a challenging job. But how do you sell it? Do you are do the fans and boosters that give, do they buy in recruits? Do they buy in that he's going to change this and tweak his system? And other teams will recruit against that until they see it. So that's probably the biggest yeah. challenge for Georgia Tech uh, in that decision that they're going to make. Absolutely. A lot of things to think about as we go through the rest of the season, but it's always a pleasure to have great hosts like you come on and talk a lot of good things when it comes to betting. Not only that, but in a legs of itself. Can you remind these folks of where they can find you, follow any of the work that you have going on currently? Sure. Social media at Danny Cannell. I love even the hate, even the vitriol. I kind of like it. I have fun with it. Uh, I have two uh, serious XM radio shows. Uh, at Dusty and Danny in the morning and then in the afternoon as well, noon to three on Mad Dog Sports Radio and then CBS Sports 
and CBS Sports HQ. You can check out all my work there on camera. Love it. Guys, come back tomorrow. Free South Friday with Drizzy Drake in the building. We're going to talk all things betting. Make sure you make even more money as we head out into the rest of the weekend. For Candace Cooper and Danny Cannell, until next time.